hurricane licenses, evacuating the elderly, the West Nile virus, and we're going to take a special look at the West Nile virus in a special interview segment with our good friends at the This Week in Virology podcast. All of that and more coming up in this episode of the Medic Cast. Transmitters? We don't need no stinking transmitters. This is the Metacast, a podcast for EMS providers by EMS providers, featuring EMS news, products, tips, tricks, and commentary. So grab your gear and glove up. Here's today's show with the pod medic, Jamie Davis. Well, good day and welcome to this week's episode of The Medic Cast. I'm your host, Jamie Davis, the pod medic, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the program this week. We have a great show coming up for you with our news items. A lot going on in the news this week affecting first responders and emergency preparedness, so we'll be talking about that. Yes, it's the hurricane. And we'll also be following up with some information on another concern that was going on before the hurricane hit, the West Nile virus outbreak. How serious is it? So we'll be talking about that in the news, and then we'll be following up all of that with a special interview segment on the West Nile virus, and I hope you'll stick around for that about halfway through the show. In the meantime, I do want to remind you to head over and check out links to everything we discussed in this and every other episode over at the MedicCast website. You can find that at MedicCast.com. Over the uh, slash blog, over there you'll find a link for the show notes right at the top of the page. You can click that link and it will take you back to the most recent episode. You can scroll down and find previous episodes that way. Go and follow up on the information there. It's important for you to do that. I can provide a lot of brief information here on the show, but it's really up to you to follow up on the information and see how it affects what you do in your area. We'll have some contact information later on in the show in a broader sense, but if you do have an email and you want to send it to me, uh, go ahead and shoot those emails out to podmedic at mac.com. And of course, uh, you can always get in touch with me on social media sites under the handle podmedic. Before we go any further, I do want to remind you um, that we have gotten a lot of emails in, uh, especially about the recent news segment I did covering the EMTs carrying firearms with them in South Africa. Um, it was entitled Gunslinging EMTs, I think, but uh, it, it raised quite a bit of commentary, and I just wanted to Thank all of you for taking the time to, to bring your comments together here on the show. Uh, a lot of people uh, to or f um, for or against the use of firearms as an emergency health care professional. And uh, some people pointing out that some already do in the work of their job. Of course, tactical EMS, uh, those EMS providers that are also law enforcement officers. Um, those are special situations. I'm talking about somebody who is simply an EMT or a paramedic. Is there really a need for them to be carrying a firearm? And, and I would propose, and I think a lot of you got this from my comments, I would propose that this is not necessary for us to do our jobs and in, men, in many cases may actually hinder us in some ways because of the, the impression that it might give to people we are treating that we are law enforcement. Uh, we already wear a uniform, many of us have a badge on that uniform. How do we distinguish ourselves from law enforcement and gain the trust so that patients will give us accurate medical histories, uh, whether it's from a bystander about a patient or the patients themselves, it really helps to uh, gain that trust as quickly and easily as possible. And the carrying of a firearm may inhibit that in some ways. That's my opinion. I know there were a lot of other opinions and I do want to thank all of you for sending those opinions in. So uh, thank you very much for doing that. Let's get on here in just a sec with the news. Please remember, we're going to be at EMS World Expo coming up in New Orleans in October, and I want to invite all of you to be there. We have a special promo code. You can get it over at the website that will get you free admission to the, in, to the exhibit hall. You can come in, see all the great stuff they got the show there, and also hang out and catch some of your favorite podcast episodes recorded live right there. So head over to the MedicCast website at MedicCast.com slash blog, and we do want to thank Physio Control for being our sponsor for the podcast studio at this event and also again thank EMS World Expo for allowing us to come in and cover their excellent event and to give you an opportunity if you can't make it to get some sense of what went on there through our coverage after the fact. So I hope you'll head over and check all that information out. 
Hopefully, we'll see you there, and make sure you come up and say hi. The first item in the news this week is an item looking at the hurricane striking the central Gulf Coast of the United States, Hurricane Isaac coming barreling in. Actually, it's already been there by the time you've heard this, and perhaps you're in the northeast and catching some of the leftover rain from that event. But uh, some of the things that happened are important to note and understand how mutual aid agreements work, how states can handle emergency situation, disaster situations. One of the things that uh, allows them to do that is the, the statement and declaration of a state of emergency. Uh, and that's important because that gives the governor and the emergency management officials specific powers during the time that that emergency has been declared. And in one of the things that the governor of Louisiana, Bobby Jindal, announced uh, this past week that by executive order for the duration of the, the hurricane recovery process, that the need for a license to operate as an EMT or a paramedic in the state of Louisiana for covered agencies would be waived. So if you're coming in from out of state, with a covered agency. So in other words, you've been requested, you've been sent in, brought in in a mutual aid agreement, not solo, but brought in together with a group of other members of your own area to come in and cover a specific area and help give some relief to the um, first responders on the scene. You will be covered and not have to have a Louisiana license to practice. And this is one of those things that happens in order for emergency operations to take place efficiently and for medical care to be provided without fear of operating outside of your licensure, your protocols, or anything else. So uh, you would go in there and operate under your protocols, under your license from whatever state or jurisdiction you come from, and you would go in there and, and use those protocols and your equipment and your materials um, and operate within the scope of your own practice. Uh, that's an important thing to, not, to note, and I think it's important for us to remember that this is how we operate under mutual aid agreements and how uh, if you don't have a specific mutual aid agreement, governors and states and specific emergency situations can waive some of those requirements in order to provide care for their states for a limited time period. And we've seen this in the past with uh, need for vaccinations for H1N1, for instance. Many states allowed paramedics to do vaccines. Uh, for a limited time frame. The state of Maryland did that and actually wrote it into our protocol formally after the fact that for a limited time, the governor could declare that paramedics in the state of Maryland could administer vaccines, uh, that you didn't have to have a special additional training, that it was simply a, a sub-Q injection or an IM injection, depending on the vaccine. Um, so anyway, that's uh, just some of the instances we use this type of uh, mutual aid agreement, this type of emergency suspension of certain duties or certain responsibilities in order to provide care. Uh, and, and it's important to understand how that works. So check out this particular link over in the show notes. And if you have any comments about this, if you've participated in recovery operations under these types of conditions and you'd like to share, uh, send those emails in to podmedic at mac.com. Next up in the news, our good friends at Acadian Ambulance have been working hard in the early days getting ready for this hurricane to strike. That time frame, they were working hard getting uh, people at risk transported, nursing home patients, hospital patients, elderly patients who needed ambulance or wheelchair van transport out of danger areas to areas where there was safe um, safe uh, areas to, to shelter them, but also the facilities needed to shelter them. So in many cases, uh, hospitals uh, were evacuating. And, and in Acadian Ambulance, I've worked with um, them before, at least on the podcast, and, and interviewed and, and talked with some of the folks down there. Uh, they're, they're a fantastic service in Louisiana and I believe also the Texas area. And they, uh, they provide a great service. And uh, this is just a great article uh, about evacuating 150 patients from a specific affiliate, a facility and taking them to compar comparable facilities in Lafayette, ba Baton Rouge, and other areas of Louisiana to provide care and get them away from the initial strike area of the hurricane. Um, this is important. Again, it goes back hand in hand with that previous news article talking about emergency preparedness and suspension of certain things like licensure requirements for emergency responders. Uh, this is also important part of that planning process 
uh, because these people now need to get back to their homes. The hurricane has passed and we're now talking about the cleanup and the recovery and, and these patients need to be taken back to their homes, to their nursing home facilities, to the hospitals and under, in the local areas where they came from. And uh, a lot of times the uh, ambulances and services may be overtaxed at this point because of response and other things that are going on. So this is where other services can come in and provide a valuable transport service and get these patients back to where they belong and uh, provide that assistance from out of state. And this is a valuable tool. It's the recovery process that the responders from outside areas are needed for. Uh, a lot of times when you talk about disaster preparedness, you're talking about people being self-sufficient for the first 48 to 30, uh, 48 to 72 hours, those first three days. Uh, people are responsible, you know, for that, that disaster kit to have that in their home and allow them to be self-sufficient with enough food and enough water and enough medications to subsist for three days in place in their own home without having to go out and call for help. And the same thing is true for the local responders, that they really need to be able to stay in gear and get things done for the first two to three days until emergency aid can begin to arrive from outlying areas and begin to provide assistance. Some of that stuff's gonna arrive in the first 24 hours, yes. But ultimately, you know, being prepared for three days means you can deal with most of the problems and then when more help arrives, you can start dealing with the bigger issues that, that needed to be put on the back burner. Uh, this is why we, we develop these systems. Now I know uh, when you compare this to the FEMA response, I know that FEMA uh, was already responding by setting up staging areas outside of the, the strike zone for the hurricane, but near to those strike zones. So maybe just uh, you know, 150, 200 miles away and then waiting for the hurricane to go by where they can then mobilize those resources that have been gathered in one place close by the central Gulf Coast. That is something that they didn't do such a good job of during the Katrina response. And this is just another indication that we need to learn lessons, that there'll be lessons that we need to learn from this response. And that's part of our process. We're never going to get it 100% right. We're always gonna run into some things that are a little bit different in each response situation. And it's how we learn from those mistakes, adapt to those, uh, adapt to those situations that make us better the next time we have to deal with something, even if it's something completely new, because that adaptability builds resilience in the system. And that's something that we need to always build into our response system. So it's just uh, interesting to see uh, articles talking about how the ambulance systems and services in these areas, like Acadian Ambulance, are involved in the evacuation of at-risk people and understand that there is a list of these at-risk people out there that allows these ambulance services to say, okay, we're going to this nursing home facility and evacuate it, then we're going over to this hospital and evacuating the rehab patients, and then we're gonna go over to this retirement community and get the, this list of patients that are wheelchair bound out. Um, all those things are on emergency managers lists and they try to catalog where these patients are, who these patients are, so that they can be reached quickly and efficiently when an evacuation order comes in. Wrapping up the news this week is a story on the West Nile virus. Now, we've heard a lot of scuttlebutt about the West Nile virus in recent weeks, saying it's the worst ever, it's, it's the most horrible uh, outbreak we've ever had since West Nile virus first showed up in the US in 1999, and uh, they cataloged the number of deaths, the, the widespread nature of the outbreak, and everything else. And, and in this CNN article, they catalog it as, or categorize it as the largest outbreak ever in the US. I take some issue with this. I've looked at the CDC figures over at cdc.gov. They have information on West Nile virus right there on the front page. You can click and go through and look at. And from what I can see, this is not the largest outbreak. There have been worse years of West Nile virus outbreaks. Uh, maybe it's just a slow news cycle. But Regardless of the fact, the public reading this doesn't necessarily know to follow up on these details and they believe the news and everything they say. Uh, sometimes I, I wonder because some of them believe the news in some things like this or uh, crazy reports about some medical research, but they don't believe uh, you know, reports on political parties because they're on part of the opposing party. Uh, I, I just don't understand that. Uh, basically, a lot of the media gets it wrong 
most of the time. And, and I get it wrong sometimes. I'm not going to say I don't. But I do try to back up everything I say with uh, research and links and things like that to, uh, to give you some additional resources to see if I'm right or wrong. Uh, and a lot of times the news articles don't do that. But they do report uh, 38 states with human infections. Uh, they, at the timing of this article, there are 1,100. Uh, at the time I recorded this particular episode, there have been 1,500 reported cases of West Nile virus in the U.S. Um, in this article, 41 deaths. At the time I recorded this, 66 deaths. So there is an increase in this, but West Nile virus has become a seasonal virus in the United States. It crops up every summer and it runs its course and starts to die out usually around the end of August, beginning of September, as the weather temperatures start to decrease again. Um, it needs to be above 90 degrees for this virus to propagate, for the mosquitoes actually to propagate easily and transmit this virus. And, um, and uh, so there are things that make this better or worse. So we'll be talking about that actually later on in the tip segment. I was actually able to uh, contact some good friends of mine over at the This Week in Virology podcast and give them an opportunity to uh, chime in on this. They're the experts, right? In fact, one of them actually wrote the book on West Nile virus called West Nile Story and tells the story of the West Nile virus as it arrived in the United States and what is the West Nile virus. So we'll be talking to them later on in this episode. But but I just wanted to point out this article. When you see an inflammatory headline, an inflammatory headline is built to sell newspapers or web page views. And it not necessarily means that the information is exactly correct when you start reading into the article itself. Often the article is, um, is more accurate, but the headline is not. And a lot of people read the headline and never look at the article and just assume they know what it means because they've read the headline. Um, so I wanted you to be better and more responsible news readers. If you see a headline that catches your eye and you think it's exciting, read the article so you understand whether the headline is just exaggerating things a little bit uh, or is taking one single fact and taking it out of context to grab your eyes. And maybe there's something or some other uh, discriminating factors involved when looking at the specific thing that caught your eye. So I hope you'll take a look at that. Next up in this episode is a very special interview segment with Vincent Racaniello, Dr. Vincent Racaniello and Dr. Dixon de Pommier. And they are the co-hosts of This Week in Virology, which is one of the podcasts over at the ProMed Network site. So you can find it over there along with the MedicCast and the other shows you might be already listening to. Uh, it's a great program. They have, also have other programs on parasitite parasitism, that's a hard one to say sometimes, and also uh, on microbiology. So if you're interested in this topic, they really know what they're talking about. They're both professors in microbiology and virology at Columbia University in New York, so they know what they're talking about. And they actually got together with myself, and I also brought in Rick Rosati from the Mitigation Journal to share his thoughts and questions. And we had him on the show to talk about West Nile virus, and actually specifically Dixon de Pommier on to ask him what he thinks about it since he wrote the book West Nile Story. Let's get on into that interview segment with the guys from This Week in Virology. I'm really excited to have a, a esteemed group of individuals along on this discussion on West Nile virus. Uh, I'm joined uh, first off by uh, one of our fellow pod podcasters, um, Rick Rosati from the Mitigation Journal, is joining me in this Q and A with the guys from the uh, This Week in Virology podcast. But uh, Rick, welcome back, and, and um, I know this is going to be one of our joint episodes. Thanks for having me on, Jamie. Appreciate being here, and uh, welcome everybody else. And um, we're also joined by Dr. Vincent Racaniello and Dr. Dixon de Pommier from the This Week in Virology podcast. And um, Dixon has actually written the book on West Nile virus or a book on West Nile virus called West <laughs> Nile Story. Uh, um, so Vincent and Dixon, welcome to the show. Thanks. Great Pleasure. to be here. Yep, good to be here. So, so Dixon, let's go ahead and kick things off with you. Um, you know, we're, our shows are primarily aimed at people that are professionals in, in healthcare, emergency preparedness, first responders. Uh, what is West Nile virus, and why is it? Seems like it's just recently popped up on the radar. 
Yeah, well, it popped up first in this country in uh, 1999. Uh, in fact, not too far from where Vince and I are sitting, uh, up in the Bronx um, and in Queens. Uh, we don't exactly understand how it came to this country, although there are some hypotheses that are uh, pretty valid still. It came at a time, though, which is commensurate with the time that we're talking about now, and that is it came at, at the worst drought recorded in the East for a hundred years. Okay, so it's a drought-driven infection, which is counterintuitive when you think about the fact that it's a mosquito-borne infection and mosquitoes require water because they're aquatic insects. So it, it begs the question, how do you initiate an epidemic of West Nile virus in people and then how do you stop it? So that, that, that arose the first year it came here because people thought it was something else. They actually thought it was St. Louis encephalitis virus. And we should probably add that it was it gets its name from the West Nile district of Uganda. Correct. Where it was first identified in nineteen forty seven? Thirty seven. Thirty seven. Yeah, it was mistaken for African sleeping sickness yeah. to begin with. And then of course it evolved into a different disease. And um, it was discovered uh, by some Israeli scientists that were working there and then brought back to Israel and worked on and strangely enough uh, as Israel became a country and, and grew into its own um, environment, I should say, <clears throat> it became a problem there too because the African birds uh, every year migrate up out of Africa into Europe and, and Asia to um, lay their eggs and they come back down after their uh, birds have matured enough to return home. And in both directions, these African birds can bring the West Nile virus to places that that are not considered endemic for the virus itself, but they have become endemic as the result of these bird migrations. So originally it was thought to be a bird disease that occasionally um, gets into people. <laughs> and they wondered, how does this work? And in every epidemic recorded up to the first epidemic in the United States, uh, they were all associated with droughts except one. And that one epidemic was in um, Bulgaria, and it was associated with a new housing development, which was incomplete because they lost their funding, and all of the plumbing had been installed, but not completed. So there was a, a, bu a bunch of standing water mm -hmm. in the basements of these newly completed apartment houses, which served as ideal breeding sites for the species of mosquito that actually transmits this from people and and from people to birds and from birds to people. It, 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 it's not thought that West Nile virus is actually transmitted from person to person. Mm -hmm. uh, it requires a bird uh, intermediate, not an intermediate host, but a, uh, a secondary host, as they're called, mm -hmm. to magnify the virus up in terms of numbers so that when the mosquito takes a blood meal from a bird, it acquires enough virus to actually transmit now to a, to a person when it takes its second blood meal. So you, you have to ask a whole bunch of questions related to ecology, and uh, it's a little beyond the scope of your uh, podcast, I think, but it suffice it to say that <clears throat> under ordinary circumstances, without droughts, when there are plenty of birds around, the West Nile virus is quiescent in people. You don't get these big outbreaks. But the, the, the moment there's a drought, it creates the conditions... <clears throat> Uh, in two ways. First of all, droughts uh, are not a great place for birds to be around because birds require water every day. And they also require lots of food because they eat about 10 times their weight in food every day just to maintain their high rate of metabolism. So when it gets hot and dry, because birds fly, <laughs> it seems to be a, a pretty obvious thing, but uh, some people seem to forget that. Birds can actually vacate a drought area because their food supply shrinks up and so does their water supply. What does this do then for the mosquitoes that have a penchant for or preferences for biting birds? It strands them because they can't fly as far away as the birds flew. And since they harbor the virus and since the air temperature is now high and the rate of replication of virus inside the mosquitoes is higher than it would have been if it had been, let's say, below 90 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the cutoff point, apparently, that's important for thinking about the transmission here. And the next thing you know, they've got these mosquitoes laden with West Nile virus. 
reluctantly taking blood meals from people to sort of bridge the gap between <clears throat> not having a, a, a preferred bird host to feed on. I'm not sure about reluctant. But still needing to reproduce. I mean, the, <laughs> the urge to reproduce from a mosquito exceeds all barriers, including taking blood from a human, which it would, this particular mosquito species, Culex pipiens and its relatives, would prefer not to do that. If given the choice between a bird and a, and a human, they will always choose the bird. But um, without birds, of course, then they, they, they eat us. I, I, when I lecture on this to students, I, I liken the bird to a steak and humans to a hot dog. <laughs> so you can all recall what it was like to be a graduate student, right? <laughs> when, when forced with the choice of having to eat no matter what and your budget is limited, you choose the hot dog because it's, a, it's sort of a stopgap measure to, to see you through the bad days. Although those are some people like hot dogs. In this case, the birds, <clears throat> the birds will return as soon as the weather changes and as soon as the rains come and replenish the environment with plant life so that the insects can return and that's the food for the birds. So at, as soon as that happens, the mosquitoes switch from people back to birds and that ends the epidemic. Guess what's happening right now? There's a huge epidemic in this country. That's, that's I guess, why we're on the air. Uh, it's occurred throughout the droughty areas of the country in the Central Valley of California, which is always droughty and always hot. And that's an endemic center. But then you've got these other pockets of infection. Vince just put the, uh, the United States map up on, on the screen to, to remind me of the fact that the, uh, the, the southwestern portion of the United States, uh, Louisiana, Texas, that area, <coughs> eastern Texas and, and western and eastern Louisiana, uh, have, have huge outbreaks of West Nile virus going on right now. And then if you go up, uh, to the central uh, northern part of, of the Midwest, to North and South Dakota, you've got another belt of infection, which corresponds to high density of people living in these two rural states of North and South Dakota, also very droughty this year. In fact, I had the, <clears throat> the pleasure of driving back from Utah all the way back to New Jersey uh, in late August, and the only thing I encountered the whole time I drove was uh, these golden fields of wheat that upon closer inspection turned out to be golden fields of abandoned corn, which had all failed because of the drought. So you've got this huge uh, drought now affecting the food crops, but you've also got it affecting the distribution and outbreaks of diseases that relate to uh, these zoonotic infections, such as the West Nile virus, which is a, a major uh, zoonotic disease in the United States today. So <clears throat> my prediction, based on what's happening right now, is that the epidemic of West Nile virus, at least in Louisiana and Texas and Arkansas, in those three states, it's going to be over with because all this rain that uh, Isaac is putting back into the environment will uh, jumpstart the growth of vegetation and bring the birds back. And when that happens, the mosquitoes will start feeding on birds instead of people. And th that'll end the epidemic. And, and by the way, in 1999, Hurricane Floyd, which occurred um, <clears throat> up the Atlantic coast, actually in September, shut down the first epidemic we've ever had from West Nile virus and, and after that. But, but it did another thing, and that is hurricanes, because they have these rotational curves to them. They picked up um, West Nile-laden mosquitoes from certain parts of the endemic center that had been created by the first outbreak and redistributed them further inland. So it jump-started the next year's outbreak of West Nile. So. Uh, Crazy things are happening, and, and it's interesting to use, um, I guess, zoonotic infections and weather and uh, biting preferences, and you mix all that together, and you come up with these very interesting scenarios about how diseases uh, maintain themselves, both in the animal and in the human populations. And Dixon, is is this a? And so you're saying this is an annual occurrence, uh, maybe it is. not this, not the severity that we're having That's this right. year, but it actually we've had occurrence. more severe outbreaks in this one. They claim this is the most severe one, but we've actually had a year where they had over three thousand cases. Yeah, I'm looking at the most recent data from the uh, CDC. Uh, they're reporting up to the 28th, uh, 1,590 cases That's right. mm -hmm. and 66 deaths. Yeah. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, so it doesn't seem when you start looking at numbers to date of 30,000 people reported 
it it yeah. seems unlikely that this is the worst year ever. Just it's doing not, averages. It, it's, uh, the, uh, the, the worst we ever had was over 3,000 cases. Uh, but keep this in mind, too. For every single case that you have that appears in a hospital, you had about 200 other people that acquired the infection and they got a subclinical infection. They never appeared in the hospital. Okay, so you have to multiply this number times 200 to find out how many total infections there were. And that's quite a bit. Well, that's because about, what is it, one out of every 150 people develop severe symptoms? That's correct. Yeah. That is right. And mostly either very old people or very young people. So, Rick, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask? Because I know from a preparedness standpoint, we've, we've seen, um, you know, people, people have called ambulances because they got a mosquito bite. Yes. Right. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, it, yeah, and gentlemen, that's, that's exactly where I, I'd like to... Uh, to you know, throw out a couple of questions and, and kind of give my uh, uh, my concern with the situation. Uh, looking at the numbers and seeing the uh, what the mainstream media is reporting, uh, you'd think we've got this terrible wave of uh, hordes of infected mosquitoes sweeping the sweeping the country. Uh, <laughs> You know, just just wiping out civilization as we know it. Um, uh, uh, uh. And, and you know, and it took about all of about thirty seconds of looking on the CDC's website to look at the statistics that back up exactly what you were saying. We've seen worse numbers in total before, That's right. and. So I was kind of wondering why, uh, why the hype? Why the uh, why the concern? Is it the the mid season numbers uh, that are so high that's a concern? Is it the, the rate of spread that's a concern? And I got to thinking about that, and and I'd like to hear your opinion on that. But um, I'm also concerned that with this increased hype and awareness, while it may drive clinicians to test for West Nile more frequently. It may drive some funding. I'm concerned we're going to find ourselves back in the position we were in when, when H1N1 uh, kind of struck. And, and I think everybody remembers that uh, the CDC, World Health Organization, used the term pandemic, H1N1 pandemic. And the media got a hold of that. And when it was all over, uh, I think those groups took a little bit of heat from the mainstream media that we equated the term pandemic with lots of dead people rather than right. really with a, the spread of disease. And I'm a little concerned that the uh, the CDC or, or other uh, governing bodies are, are going to take a, a, another blow to their credibility when we see this hype in numbers. When in fact, as you've already pointed out, sir, that this really isn't that severe by the numbers. What do you think of those points? Who wants to go first? Go ahead, Dixon. Go ahead. Uh, my, my opinion is the same as it was in 1999 when it first uh, arrived on our shores. There was a, a real uh, panic situation that developed because they'd never heard of this infection before. Uh, and it's something new. And, and because we were on red alert for lots of other things, you know, uh, uh, it, it sort of made people hyper aware of the fact that they live in dangerous times. And uh, anything that causes death, and in this case, we have the neurological version of this uh, infection, neuroinvasive form, which does uh, have a higher rate of mortality than the uh, non-neuroinvasive form. Uh, and because older people are affected, and because we have a lot of older people living in this country, and, uh, and like you say, uh, as soon as they hear that it's a mosquito-borne infection, the moment they get bitten by a mosquito, they want to go to the hospital to see if they're positive or negative. Uh, it, and it's a slow news day. <laughs> you know, they're tired of writing about failed crops and lack of water. And uh, Texas has had three years of drought in a row now. Uh, and two years in a row, that's, that's a lot because they lost about $10 billion worth of crops. I mean, that's an enormous amount of loss. That doesn't make news anymore. Here's something that finally does hit the headlines, and and it and it raises uh, expectations beyond the real uh, level of the situation. And and so, I think what you're doing is having this aired out. I hope a lot of older people are listening because they need to know that it's not a disease that you should be panicking about. Well, the the problem is that the press always likes to. Uh overblow things. They did this with the 2009 H1N1. Sure. There was lots of evidence that it was not going to be a terribly serious pandemic, uh, yet, right. you know, all right. the major news outlets reported otherwise. It turned out to be not very serious. 
I think they're they're fascinated with infections, particularly virus infections, <laughs> and it makes good headlines and they sell papers. Unfortunately, the CDC I think does a good job of putting the information out there right. in a neutral way. Here, here. And you, you guys have both gone to the website and you can see the numbers right there. Yeah, uh, this isn't a huge number of infections. Um, that maybe part of the issue is that we don't have a way yet of preventing the infection. We don't have a vaccine. We don't have an antiviral. Of course, we have both for influenza. And so maybe it's a little scary because of that. But as far as I know, you can help prevent being infected or being bitten by a mosquito. There are natural precautions you can take to do this. And they're all on the website. You know, if you have a lot of standing water around, you should get rid of it. You should have screens on your houses. You should wear repellent if you have to go out in long sleeve shirts, etc. You can minimize the risk of being bitten. So imagine, Vince, though, living in Texas, it's very hot to begin with. The nights are very hot. You want to leave your windows open. A lot of people don't use screens. Yeah, there you go. And the next thing you know, you're inviting the enemy into your house. Of course, of course. And in fact, Culex pipiens is known as the northern house mosquito, although it's found in other places too. Um, A version of Culex that can carry this is found throughout the entire United States. So uh, it's unavoidable. And and the infection is endemic now in the United States in wildlife. All right, it has rearranged the landscape in terms of wildlife. For instance, if you're a crow. It's got about a 80 to 90 percent mortality rate figure. If you're a wild horse, it kills over 40 percent of wild horses. So well, humans are lucky. Huh? I think we're very <laughs> lucky uh, that our mortality. So it's really the crows who should be calling the ambulance. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly. You know, it was interesting to hear. If, if you, you guys said if someone gets a mosquito bite, they may call, call for an ambulance. Well, there's no test that will reveal infection. Not the same fast. day it takes it takes uh, about seven days a few days if you're going to look for virus or of course if you're going to look for a serological response it takes two weeks sure that's exactly so right. uh, don't don't do that no <laughs> and, and that, know, the, the, that i think is the important part of a, a reasonable public education campaign and and reasonable reasonable mitigation of the situation as far as uh, you know having having the right information in, in uh in the hands of the uh, the civilian population that uh that will be <laughs> doing those types of things. Sure. Yeah, the, the thing is that if, if you can recognize the early symptoms of the right, uh, West right. Nile virus, you can get that person to the hospital in time to give them steroids. And well, that, no, 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 not steroids. Uh, they're giving them steroids. Not for prevent, encephalitis. Not for prevent encephalitis. Prevent brain swelling. No, not for West Nile. That's the one you don't want to give steroids for. Uh, I've spoke to a physician about this. What was their advice? Not steroids. There are others. There, if you're if you're in the encephalitic phase, you you can do other things. But you're not going to ne- initially have encephalitis. You're going to have non-specific symptoms, Confusion, right? Pain, pain, diarrhea, fever, That's headache. Right. You right. know, headache. appetite exactly. loss, muscle aches. Exactly. Probably not respiratory no, symptoms, not right? At all. Not at all. So let's say you're in an area where there has been West Nile activity. And you ha- you have mosquito bites, and then you develop these symptoms. You should probably see a physician, and have a test done. Um, and then the problem is that if you are positive, now what? What, you can't do anything except be observed. And then if you develop headaches and and what looks like neurological symptoms, then you would have to be admitted and and be supported. Uh, a physician told me, and this is a physician who does research on the virus, he said, West Nile is one of those encephalitides where you don't use steroids. It's actually counterproductive. I don't know if he was right or not. I, I know that in many you do use steroids. but Okay. I stand corrected. But I, I know in the beginning of this epidemic in the United States in 1999, 2000, 2003, they were still giving steroids to keep down the brain swelling. But And the, I, the reason why little kids and um, – Young adults don't suffer as badly from this infection as older people is because the brain case has not cemented shut yet. And so as brain swelling occurs, there's room for it to go because the joints that hold the brain case together can still come apart. Mm. Uh, But in an older person, that's absolutely cemented shut and there's no way for the brain to expand because there's no space for it to go into. And that's what the pathology of this... uh, the fatal diseases are from. So it says on the CDC website, no controlled studies have been done on the use of steroids and other drugs to manage West Nile encephalitis. Mm. So there may be anecdotal use, you know. Right. 
Well, and it's but just it's, the, the, the treatment for this everywhere I've looked is, is really just supportive care for the symptoms, treating the problem right. and letting the virus run its course, um, which is so often what we do with viruses. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. So antivirals are not appropriate in this sense either. Well, they aren't. They're not available. But Dixon, if we had a vaccine and we had antivirals, do you think a lot of people would take the vaccine? Ah, well, it depends on where you live. <laughs> <laughs> I think if you lived in Scottsdale, Arizona, and you were 67 years old, and yeah, you had an yeah. enormous retirement benefit in front of you, and you wanted to live a good life, you might elect to take right. that vaccine. Yeah, and, and I think that's what's going on here in, around Dallas, too. That's a big um, populated area, all right? And, and of course, uh, there's a lot of wealthy people that live in that area as well. And I think, you know, there's a there are viral infections which affect the poor rather than the rich in other countries. And we just don't think of uh, viral infections in this country as dividing off in that direction. So that when people of substance acquire these infections, they start to raise the red flag earlier than, let's say, migrant workers would in California or even in Texas, which they are also in infected by this uh, virus. So Texas uh, had had lots of cases of West Nile, but not in this big populated area around Dallas. It's mostly, mostly been in, in migrant workers, and the same is true in California. So, you know, we just pay less attention, unfortunately, to those uh, poor, unfortunate people that are obliged to work in that way because they have no real spokesperson to come out and, and uh, help them out of this situation. That is going to wrap up this week's episode of the show. I want to thank all of you for checking out the program this week and remind you to head over to our website and follow up on the links and information. There's going to be a link to the This Week in Virology podcast. There's going to be a link to the CDC information that was discussed in this interview segment, as well as additional information on West Nile virus signs and symptoms. And we're actually going to follow up next week with another episode talking specifically about medical care for West Nile virus victims. So you can just have that in the back pocket if you happen to run into a patient who might be suffering from West Nile virus's more severe uh, episodes. Uh, not a happen, doesn't happen to every patient, but it can happen to some of them. You can find all of that over at medicast.com slash blog. And you can also follow up and leave a comment over there if you want to get back in touch with me. Or reach me by email. Email me at podmedic at mac.com. And of course, you can always find me over on the social media sites under the handle podmedic. Twitter.com slash podmedic and Facebook.com slash podmedic. Also, I want to remind you to keep on checking out the MedicCast Facebook page. We just hit 3,100 members and fans over there. If you aren't already a fan of the MedicCast Facebook page, I would urge you to head over and click the like button. You can find it at facebook.com slash MedicCast. And while you're there, check out the show, check out the links and articles I post there. I post a lot of things there throughout the course of the week that never make it onto the show. But uh, interesting articles, interesting items, interesting tips that you might find that are useful to you in your EMS practice. And all that's available over on the Facebook fan page. If you are already a fan, thanks for being a fan and continue to uh, comment over there, share your thoughts, respond to some of the articles and share them. And there's a share link on all of them. You can share them back on your own Facebook page. And by doing so, spread the word about the MedicCast all around your friends and colleagues. And that's important. I really appreciate that. But it is a community effort here on the MedicCast. So thanks a lot. Before we head out, I want to remind you, we are going to be at EMS World Expo in New Orleans. You can use the promo code FP50. And using that promo code will give you free admission to the exhibit hall. So if you just want to head down and check out the exhibit hall, all the cool stuff that's down there, the new tools, the ambulances, the, the amazing information that you can gain just from walking around the exhibit hall is, is huge. And so I would urge you, if you think you're going to be in the area of New Orleans at the end of October, beginning of November, see if you can get down there and I can get you in free just by using the promo code FP. 
P50. You can head over to emsworldexpo.com and use that promo code when you check out for the exhibit hall pass, and it'll clear that all up for you and get it for you for free. So I hope you'll take advantage of that. And again, thanks to EMS World Expo for having us down to cover their event, and thanks to Physio Control for having us down and sponsoring the podcast studio, which is always important, and we want to thank them for being strong supporters here of the MedicCast. That's it. We'll go ahead and close out the show. I'm Jamie Davis, the pod medic. You can find me back here on the medic cast. And of course, over on my other programs over at promednetwork.com. You'll find all of that there. But in the meantime, please remember scene safety and BSI.